All right. Um, I am going to start with prayer because it's a really good place to start. And then um, we'll get going. So thank you, Heavenly Father, that we have the ability to grow beautiful things, that we can grow food, that you have given us seeds and life and all the things that we need to put them all together. And I praise you, I give you glory today, and may the words I speak be clear and understandable, and may people go out enthused to go grow something. So I thank you in Yeshua's name, amen. All right, so I am Shannon Campo, and since all of you are my friends, this is good. <laughs> And I um, used to be a master gardener, and I'm a certified permaculture designer, which I'm really excited about. And that's a way of using all the things to create a sustainable system for growing food, for taking care of people, for um, just taking care of the planet. So I am not amazing. There's no one reason why I'm up here and you're down there. It's more that I've probably just killed more things than all of you put together, and I've learned something from it. So... I am, I'm not claiming anything uh, special, but uh, right now this world's kind of crazy. If you look at the news, you look at what's going on, you look at tanks, you look at all the people who are sick, um, it's exhibiting what we, it, we need a savior, right? A de redeemer. And so gardening is not sticking your head in the sand and going, la, 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 I'm not paying attention. Gardening is doing the very first job we were given when we were put on this planet. And that was just to steward the, the, the land, steward ourselves, take care of people. And so when you learn something, you can then share it, spread it, and there's hope in that. There's hope in planting a seed. And so I'm hoping to spread some hope. I'm hoping to spread some joy. And um, that when you go out, you can work with the creator and bring life. All right, so first, there's no such thing as a black thumb. There is, uh, does anybody know the story of where green thumbs came from? It's actually a physical trait that gardeners had because they were out in the garden and they would snip things off with their thumb. Their thumb would literally get green from chlorophyll. And so it was like, oh, that person has a green thumb. Look at all the plants they're growing. Well, it was because they were doing it. They were out there experiencing it. So that's how they earned their green thumb. So therefore, everybody can earn a green thumb. All you have to do is learn some stuff. And so usually the most reasons people kill things is they don't know how to take care of the plant, so they kill it. They're not really that interested in taking care of the plant, so it dies. Or they just are crazy, crazy busy. They're interested, but they're just really busy, and they don't plan to make time to take care of the plant, and so the plant dies. All of those are either fixable or you get a silk plant. I mean, that's your <laughs> choices. So there's no such thing as a black thumb, and everyone's going to kill something. If you kill something, just what can you learn from it and go forward from there? All right, so what is a seed? Does anybody know what a seed is? We got little, little munchkins, so. All right, well, this is the technical version. It's a plant embryo, which means plant baby, and it has nutrient tissues to fish, feed the embryo enclosed in a protective outer coating. So it's everything a seed needs to start growing and hold it until it gets the cotyledons, which is the first two leaves, and then be able to start photosynthesizing. So some seeds can actually exist quite a long time before they need to photosynthesize. Now we have two kinds of seeds here. The bean seed is a dicot. Die is two. So that makes the two little leaves up on top. And it has the little leaves, it's got the root, and it's got the cotyledon and all of that energy all inside that, leaf, that little seed. And then the monocots, corn is an example, is it just has one single stem. So like your onions, your corn, grasses, they're all monocots. And say so they grow a little differently and their seeds has everything that it needs within it. Okay, so as I'm going, if you have a question about what I'm talking about specifically, go ahead and throw up your hand and we can talk about it. Or if you have something to add, because I know there's a lot of gardeners here, go ahead and, and share it too, because that could be very interesting. And I'll repeat it so that way everybody can hear um, where we are. Okay, so why are seeds important? What happened?
So no, see, and what do we need to live? Like everything depends on plants. Like everything depends on plants. So seeds are incredibly important. Okay, can we eat seeds? Yeah, so sunflowers, chia, coconuts, corn, pepitas, peas, pomegranate, wheat. Um, reminder, don't eat a seed until you've identified it. <laughs> don't go out and start munching on things. Well, there's lots and lots of things that we eat. Okay, so we have some fun facts about seeds. The smallest seeds are that of an orchid. These are some of my orchids, and I have yet to see a seed from them. They are 10 billionths of an ounce, and they float. That's how they end up in the trees, because most orchids are the aerial plants, and they float around, and then they land in the crevice of a tree, and then they grow. So that is a tiny, tiny thing. And then the largest seed is bigger than you guys. Like, this seed is bigger than you. And if it fell on your head, you'd be really, really sorry. The world record for this one is uh, 92 pounds. And the seed inside that fruit was 38 pounds. Like, that's pretty massive. And it's a Lodiacea malevica, or a double coconut. And every once in a while, you'd see these floating around in the ocean, and they'd pick them up. Couldn't figure out what they were. They only grow in a very small island off of Madagascar. Okay, so I have seed packets. Hey, you guys want to help me? Can you run around and give everybody a couple of seed packets for me? Yeah. All right, and here's some for you. Go give like two or three to everybody. Can you do that? Thank you. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at a seed packet real quick. And seed packets can be really, really informative. And sometimes they can be frustrating if they don't have enough information on them. All right, so on your seed packet, it usually has the name both in English and the Latin one. Why would the Latin one be important? Because the common name, sometimes there's four or five plants that are, have the same common name. And so you might be like, oh, I know what this is. And then you grow it and you're like, no, that's not what I thought it was. So the Latin name is uh, very, very technical. Thank you. And it will make sure that you know what plant you're actually growing. It's also good because if you have plants like in the melons or in the curcubits or cucumbers, you can tell what crosses with other things by that Latin name. And if the Latin name matches, you know they'll cross. So you don't want to save, so if you had two kinds of a melon and a cucumber growing by each other and you're like, oh, I'm going to save some seed, you're going to get a curcumelon the next year. <laughs> you probably won't have a just a cucumber or a melon because they cross. And so knowing and reading that Latin name, that also can be important. Um, it also, if you're intentionally crossing something, you can also know that if, if it will cross or not. So if you're looking to get a, a red sunflower, if you know certain parts of that, they're the same family, you know that you can cross it and have something viable come out of that. So that's one thing. Another thing, here, why don't you guys yell out some of the stuff. Oh, yes, thank you. Yell out some of the stuff that's on your seed packet. You guys are quiet. When you sow outside. outside, that's a good one. Days to germination. Sowed up, yep. Seeds facing, sunny or shady. So all these things will help you be successful when you plant these. Thank you. Um, especially the depth of your seed and things like that. So if you don't know anything about growing seeds, they come with their own instructions, which is pretty cool. Um, some packets have more information than others. But um, one important thing to look on your seed packet is days to maturity. Because we have 144 days between our first and our last frost to grow something, right? And some of those things aren't real happy the day after, like, last day frost, because it's still not cold. It's still cold. We need seeds? Mm -hmm. 
So that's one thing to be uh, very cognizant of. So if you have a tomato and it's 150 days to maturity, you know you're going to have to start it earlier inside or something like that to get it. So those are all things to be um, thinking about. And also um, a lot of times it has temperature on there, like what temperature it likes it to be at to, to grow. Some of the more fancy seed packets or Johnny's have those temperatures on there too. Good question. Thank you. So days to maturity means from the time you plant the seed to when you get something off of it that you're harvesting. Yes. Right. Yes. So days to maturity, if you're looking to grow a radish, might be 28 days because they you put it in the ground and you can harvest it at 28 days. For a tomato, you're hoping for two months of harvesting. So you have to, you know, okay, so it takes me this many days to get to maturity, and I want two months, and frost is here. You need to shove the whole thing back. Yep, good question. Thank you. Any other questions about that kind of thing? Yes. Okay. So that way, um, like I have a seed tray up here with babies in it, and I have onions in it, and days to from days to germination is like 21 days. So that tells me at two weeks, 14 days, and nothing's happening, just wait, just wait, it's coming, you know, kind of thing. And then other things are five days. And so, you know, at day 10, if nothing's come up, eat, something went wrong, <laughs> you know, and so either reseed, check and see if it was too hot, you know, all the different things to you can do to fix that. So, yes, yes. Stick the plant in the ground? So for maturity is from when you start the seed to when you want, when your first harvest comes. So in that case, it would state that on the seed packet from, germina from germination to harvest is so many days. Otherwise, days to maturity is generally from when you put the seed in the ground to the thing. So some, some seed companies are, like Johnny's is really, really good at this of like how many days it takes from when you have an actual little plant to harvesting something. Because you can affect your days to germination by what you've done to your soil. Like if your soil is really cold and something needs to be warm, it's going to hang out and go like, I'm not doing nothing. And three weeks later, it finally gets warm enough, and it's like, oh, I'll grow now. Well, you've just lost, you know, whatever time it took. So for a lot of farmers and things like that, they're looking at more detailed data. Generally, on your seed packet, the simple ones we're looking at, it's going to only be from when you stick it in the ground to maturity, average germination rate kind of thing. So, yes, Timothy has... Um, built a program called Garden Time, and we'll, I'll show you that later. And he spent oodles of hours looking at seed germination rates and packets and information online. And so he's like up here on the level of all the data part. So yes, he's, he's right, but on the seed packets, it's not usually that, not that advanced kind of thing. Okay, so what does the seed need to grow? So we kind of spoke about this already. It's, it depends on an, the environmental factors. Um, and this is the order that I think affects it most. So water, the seed has to have water. If it does not have water, it's not going to start to germinate. That's a trigger for many, many things. Sunlight, temperatures, depth, and soil. All of those things have to, because you can grow a seed without soil. It just doesn't do a whole lot once it's, it's started. But um, as long as that seed doesn't need extra things like scarification, which means the seed coat has to be broken down some way, or stratification, which means that seed has to go through cold period, which is like it went through winter time, 
um, like a lot of your tree seeds and things like that have to go through that cold period. A lot of perennial seeds like your echinacea, a coneflower, some of your daisies, they have to go through that cold period because otherwise when they throw their seed at the end of fall, they're like, yay, I'm in the ground, it's sunny, it's warm, I'm going to start growing, and two weeks later it snows on them. Not a good plan for a baby plant, right? So there's a clock kind of thing that has to get triggered. It has to go through so many days of cold, and it's like, okay, I'm in winter time. Don't do anything. Wait. And then once that cold gets done and it gets warm again, then it's like, yay, I can grow now. So it helps preserve that plant. And that's usually a lot of the plants that are perennial, um, native to northern climates kind of thing. The seeds that are tropical, they have no self-preservation, and they don't have a clue about waiting. And so they get in trouble up in the north kind of thing. Um, the ones that need scarification are like morning glories. Morning glories will grow down south, but they need to have that seed coat. It's a really hard seed coat. It has to be worn down by either water or time. And so you can help that. You just sort of grind a little groove in the seed coat and you help break it open so the water gets into it, and then it'll germinate and grow quicker that way, too. Did they? Yeah, I, I saw them through the ice. Nice. Yep, there are some plants underneath the snow. They're pretty crazy. Nice. I'm glad you're planting seeds. That's good. All right. So what I'm going to go through in our slideshow, though, is this order. Soil depth, water, sunlight, temperature, when we're looking at the um, things. So if you're taking notes, that's the order we're going to go in. All right. So I'm going to talk a little bit about containers for uh, growing things. Um, this is, I have too many containers, I think. This is one part of one of my shelves in the garage. I like terracotta. These are little ones, and the most important thing about a container is that it holds soil and it has a hole in the bottom, okay? If it doesn't have a hole in the bottom, it can't drain extra water and you will drown your plant no matter how careful you are. It just, it will happen. So I have a variety of containers. These are little peat pots. This is a yogurt cup that we put nail holes through the bottom of. These are official, like, fancy ones that I collect. Um, every time I get a plant or someone has a plant or someone has a stack of pots, I'm like, yoink. So I have found I really appreciate those. Um, I've got paper pots, and my brother-in-law made me this little paper pot maker, which is pretty cool. You wrap the paper around here, stuff the bottom in, squish it, and you make a little paper pot. Um, one thing I do realize is that with our soil in Michigan, we don't get warm enough soil usually until it's mid-June kind of thing. So the whole month of May, even if the plant can handle being in the cold, if you have it in a paper or a peat pot, the ground is not warm enough and the soil biology is not active enough to actually break this down. And so you're literally planting your pot as if you were planting it in plastic. And so your plant's like, I want out. And the peat's like, sorry, not going anywhere yet. And so I usually um, break them up or I literally pop them right out of the peat pot and grow them any because they don't break down. The paper breaks down quicker, but I usually just rip everything off and be just real careful at keeping my root ball um, happy. So that is one thing that I kind of cringe at when people are like, oh, yeah, just plant the peat pot. I'm like, not in Michigan. Maybe, maybe further south. That works really well. But when we're up this far north, that's not a real great idea. But, um, yep, just it's got a hole, and it holds your soil. Those are the, the biggest things that you really want with a container. Um, you can start it in anything. The most imp One other thing is, though, is you don't want to put this teeny tiny plant in a giant pot of soil because your plant has to manage that soil. The life in the soil comes from the plants. It comes from the living things. 
that are in it. So if you don't have really awesome soil or really good compost that has all that soil biology in it, you put a tiny plant in a big thing of soil and your soil will just turn into a brick. There's not that life that it needs to, to keep it going. If you put it in something small and then you work your way up, your plant then can keep managing it. So it'd be like putting a baby in the middle of the gym and say, here you go, baby, have fun. You're not going to be comfortable in that space. You don't know what to do. You're going to get lost in that space. Whereas if you put a baby maybe in the playpen with a couple toys, we're good, you know? The baby can find everything it needs and, and be contained better. So I had a little boy ask me, he's like, why can't we just stick in a big pot and not worry about potting up? And I'm like, well, because I don't know how to explain this to you. Because <laughs> it was something I hadn't learned well enough yet. But soil is so important, and the life in that soil is so important. So um, that's a, a really good thing. And a lot, another reason why I start things in containers a lot is because I have a lot more control over a container than I do putting it out in the garden. I can control the amount of water it gets, um, whereas out in the garden... Sometimes it's hit or miss. You might have a torrential downpour and all your seeds wash away. Um, I can control animals. You know, there's a lot of beetles that like to eat your seeds. <laughs> and they take off with them. The squirrels, the chipmunks, they all like eating seeds. And so that way I can get a plant established. And then I can keep track of germination better that way too, especially if I'm trying to keep track of my germination rates for seeds. Um, and then I can control most of the variables. And then another thing is I can then plant them out at the correct spacing because I hate thinning. Thinning to me is like wasting all these babies. And so that way I can plant them in the right, the right order. All right, this is one of, these are some of the babies that came up in my garden. They're so pretty, aren't they? Um, so soil is really important. You want to have friable and level soil if you're planting seeds and scattering them or an intentional little groove like this is what I did with this row of lettuce, was made this little groove so it all stays in the same spot. And then um, it helps keep your uh, soil. I'm, I'm a no-till proponent because all the life in that soil is all interconnected. And when you run a rotor tiller through it, it's kind of like taking a tank through your house. You just ruined all of the air, like the aisles and the, the wormholes and the all the microfungi, the, the um, mycelium, all of that is connected. There's like miles and miles of that in a very small amount. And when you take a rotor tail, you just obliterate all that. It all dies, and then it has to regrow. And so there's places for tilling, but the annual tilling, the multiple annual tilling, the tilling just to weed, to me seems like it's counterproductive because you want that life in the soil. That's what's going to make your plants healthy. That's what actually brings nutrients to your plants. And so usually just a rake on the first couple inches, maybe, of your soil to smooth it out. And then when you cover it with mulch, you are then protecting your soil and adding nutrient in that way. Okay. Um, seed starting mixes. Yep. Yeah. Mulch is a thing that you put on top of your soil, like leaves or wood chips or um, shredded paper, something that covers your soil that's made of organic, which is like usually a, a wood product or something like that. Does that make sense? Yeah, so if you chip your leaves, that's really, really good mulch, actually. It's like great mulch. Um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, the reason why you want sterile soil usually for your seed starting mix is then you're not combating things like damping off. You're not worrying about mold and fungus that might be in there that can kill your seed. Um, when I'm really good and I have an amazing compost pile... I will use that as my soil start. But for right now, I am using, I've used all three of these. Um, they have different levels of peat in them. They have different levels of different things. I usually mix a couple of them and put them together to get what I want. I just brought this one. I am by no means advertising for them. Um, but it's a 
kind of a, a light, fluffy medium that makes it easy for the seed to um, grow in, and you have to wet it before you put your seeds in. Because if you plant your seeds in dry soil and then put water in it, it goes, and it just overflows. <laughs> it's like, uh trying to think of, it's like when you put vinegar and uh, baking soda together, <laughs> it just kind of, it, it sucks up all the water and just overflows everything. So you want to make sure it's damp before you plant stuff into it. Hmm. Fungus is a type of a mushroom. Do you know what a mushroom is? And so there's good fungus and there's bad fungus. And there's some funguses that eat things we want to keep. And so we want to keep that out of our soil. Okay. Omari is um, a really good symbol on a lot of things. That means that it's not made with, um, it doesn't have any man-made chemicals in it. And most of the things have been sustainably harvested. Um, so I, I t typically go for that. It also means that there's no human waste product in it because morganite is human waste product, and that is not something that I want to put on food that I'm going to be eating. So just a heads up about that. Um, I, was, I thought they were joking when someone told me she was a spokesperson for morganite. I'm like, wait a minute, human waste? She says, yes. No. <laughs> So I choose not to use that, and the, um, they don't allow that in their um, uh, products. Okay, so when you plant outside, it's really good to water your soil in first, and then you can plant outside. You want it to be moist and crumbly, uh, like that, some people say like cake batter kind of thing, but just enough moisture that you know your seed has it there and it's going to stick in. Um, <clears throat> I leave weeds but I cut them off at the top. So if it's not a perennial weed, if it's not grass or something that I know is going to keep coming back on me, I just chop it off at the top and leave the roots in there because those roots will decay and then create more um, aeration for the soil. It'll create more life in there and it's easier. And then I just leave all the green of it on top of the soil and adds a mulch to it. So um, we had kids that were with us for one of our um, internships, and I came out with scissors, and I'm like, all right, guys, we're going to weed. And they're looking at my scissors going, what? <laughs> and we just literally cut all the weeds down and then laid it all on top of the, the soil, and that was weeding, and they thought it was great. They were like, there's no dirt. <laughs> it was fun. So um, that nitrogen that's in those leaves will just break down and go right back into the soil, especially if you stay on it and you keep them small. It's... Yes. So my problem is that I do wild edibles. I'm like, oh, that's lamb's quarter. We can eat that. I'll leave that one. And oh, there's purslane. We can eat that one. I'll leave it. And then I'll, I know. <laughs> yes. So that's the problem is like cut it and put it in the basket and then eat it. You know, don't leave it. <laughs> so I get in trouble that way. Timothy's like, you have to be more ruthless. So yes. So, yep, and also by leaving the roots in the ground, it holds your soil. And so, like, you don't get it blowing away. Like, we're losing inches of our prairie land because they don't leave cover on it, and it's ending up in the Atlantic Ocean, which is really, really sad. I think we've lost six feet of our topsoil in the Midwest region due to that fact, and I think we only have about six to nine feet left, which in 100 years... We've lost that much. So what happens when you take off the covering of soil? It dries out, and all of the corn, all the coins, corn, soybean, potato monocultures that grow in the Midwest, well, they usually strip their soil at the end of the year, and they just leave it bare. Well, then when the wind comes and it's dry, it picks up that soil, and it actually ends up in the atmosphere and then it gets dumped into the Atlantic Ocean because our prevailing winds come from the west and move out. And so they have measured dropping of six feet of our prairie topsoil over, what, since the Great Depression, or um, the Dust Bowl is one of those times where, yeah, anyway, there's a lot of history in there I could get into. But, yes, yeah, so that is, that's a thing that you want to protect your little garden plot from, 
you're having your soil run away. Okay, here's another easy way. If you do not have a garden, or you want to see if you want to garden in a certain spot, you just take a bag. On the bottom of that, if you're ever grumpy one day, and you really need to get some aggression out, you take your screwdriver and you're like, <laughs> you put a bunch of holes in it, flip it over, and then you cut open the top and you make sure you leave those edges so that way it holds the soil in. And then you grow your plant in there and the plant will actually grow down through those holes you made into the ground below that bag. But you've got all this soil contained there. And then if you want to leave it, because you've just killed all the grass under it, you just kind of rip the bag up and pull it out and you leave a little pile of soil. Or you're like, nope, this wasn't a good spot. Just grab the whole thing and move it. Or we could make a garden in the house. We could do, we could, if we made a house, we could leave a place with some dirt and we could make a garden right there. That would be a really cool house to have a garden in the middle. I'm trying, but mine are all in pots. I don't have a hole with the soil yet. <laughs> say no. <laughs> All right, here's a here's square foot garden. Here's another thing that you can do that's on a smaller scale. And then um, I still do some of the square foot stuff in my garden and mark everything off because then I'm like, okay, this section's this kind of lettuce and this section's this kind of lettuce. And if I want to do rotational planting, I know, okay, this section is my radishes, and then two weeks I'm going to plant this section with radishes, and then two weeks I'm going to plant this section with radishes, and then those guys are ready. And then we start over. And that way it helps me keep track of where I want to do things, and it makes my organizable little square person happy. <laughs> is it just tape over the, over the top, or is it actually sectioned off? Um, I, it's just tape. It's the soil is all still together. Um, it's it might be like packing tape, you know, like that, whatever. Um, some people use sticks. I use a string, and then little stakes and stuff like that. Okay. If you don't have a spot right now, and you need to make a spot, lasagna gardening is an amazing way to create a garden bed that you're going to use in the future. So. In the fall, or if you know you want a garden bed, but you're not going to get to it this year, and you don't have time to kill all the grass, lasagna garden is great. It's layers of like cardboard or um, newspaper, and then leaves, and then this is a uh, composted manure, and the combination of your browns and your greens and your paper all suppress weeds and then break down and create. It's a cold compost process, and it creates your new bed space without you having to dig anything or till anything but it does take time um, I love chipped leaves you just mow them with your lawnmower don't even have to like get a chipper you just mow them and then scoop them up and put them wherever you want they're really great mulch too okay raised beds these are a couple of ours um, Ours are 18 inches, I think, total. They were three cedar boards tall. And so they were, they went down, they're 18 inches tall. Um, I think only a foot of it is above ground and then the other part was below ground. And I live on beach sand. We're talking pure, beautiful sand. And so we need all the help we can get. So we did raised beds to try to help keep and contain our soil where it was. On the bottom, we put hardware mesh, um, which is a, quarter inch metal uh, fabric it's called but it's metal screen and that allows water to go through it allows your roots to go down deeper but it keeps the moles and the voles out of your really good soil because that's where all the earthworms live and the moles are like hey that's a great place for me to go have dinner and in the process they go through all your roots and then the thank you Earthworms are really amazing little animals that you want to have in your garden. They're they're just worms. Yep. Earthworms. I love earthworms. That means that your your ground is is. <laughs> yes. I have not heard about that. 
I do know that there are earthworms that when you release the the red wiggler worms that aren't native to our area, they eat all of the understory leaves and stuff, and then they don't leave enough for they don't leave leave enough leaves for our woods to maintain their fertility. They just eat everything. So that can be an issue, but that is a um, a worm that usually we use for fishing kind of thing. So earthworms function by eating detritus on top of the soil. So they're eating leaves, they're eating small pieces of plants that lay on top of the soil, and then they eat that, and then they have amazing poop. <laughs> <laughs> and that is extremely high in nitrogen. So we want them. It's just that some of them that are not native here are eating too much, and they're not in the ecosystem in balance. And so that is where we're running into issues, and then some of those are being released in places that earthworms aren't usually native and aren't in the ecosystem, and so they're creating a, an unbalance there. The ones you have in your garden are going to show up because they're here, they're native, and they don't eat your roots. They're not the root eaters. The things that eat your roots are voles, and then the moles plow through your roots in pursuit of worms, but they're not actually eating your roots. But a lot of people, they, it creates the same problem. It killed your plant. <laughs> so. They eat your earthworms. They eat all the little bugs in the ground. So, I mean, they eat grubs too, but, you know, it's it, they're, they do a thing. They're not necessarily evil. They just, they're doing their thing. And what our thing and their thing kind of doesn't, it's not happy to compatible together. And so that way, by putting that hardware cloth under it, you're keeping them out of where you want to, they very rarely climb. I mean, you're not going to find a mole climbing over a little hill thing. So, and then we have a really tall, couple tall raised beds as well. But for us, in our sand, we found it to be very helpful. For those in really heavy clay, raised beds are also very helpful too, because then you can control your soil. We're on a hill. We use our raised beds sometimes all the time. That's perfect. And then vertical gardening, if you don't have a ton of room, that's eight feet tall. It's a couple of the tall spikes together. Um, you can go up with your stuff. And beans, cucumbers, small squash, small melons, all that kind of stuff can go up. And what this is is um, those tall green stakes, heavy-duty stakes in the ground, and then zip tied to that is just uh, a four-foot by three-foot panel mesh is it a gate panel or some sort of thing like that? And then we have a couple of them just zip tied onto the bed. And then the next year when I rotate my crops, you just rotate the whole thing. So, and these are purple pole beans, which I have seeds for back there, and they're really good. Okay, so how deep do you plant it? Read the seed packet, because if you plant something too deep, it may never ever come up. If you don't plant it deep enough, it may not be moist enough, long enough to come up. So the smaller the seed, the shallower to plant it. So some seeds don't want to be even underground, like carrot seeds are these finicky queens that want to be moist all the time, but please don't cover me up. How do you keep something moist that's laying on bare soil in the sun, right? Yeah, no, this doesn't work very well. So they, you have to like put a board over it or, or do different things. Um, so outside, it's probably more important, that depth. Inside, in my um, little seed tray that I start stuff, I can control the moisture. I can control things better. And then sometimes things need seed, need light to germinate. Like they will not germinate until they have light. A lot of these are like our weed seeds. They're like, I see light, grow. And <laughs> they grow as fast as they can, usually because they are in disturbed soil. And so they, they get moved around, moved around, and all of a sudden they make it to the surface, and they grow as fast as they can. 
So if something's not growing for you and everything's perfect, the seed's not old, but you've got good moisture on it, you know, check and see if it needs light or check and see if it needs dark. And to that one of those things might help you. Okay. Water. Okay, this is a long, long time ago. Um, we had this one of our rain barrels. So seeds need water to wake them up. Um, I use rain water whenever possible. Our city water has chlorine in it. Chlorine does a good job of killing things because we don't want some things in our water, but it also kills things. And so um, it can affect your seeds. If you have no other option, let your water off gas. So like put it in a jug that has opening on it and for 24 hours let it off gas. Um, catching rainwater is really easy. You can just stick things outside when it's raining and collect that water if you want. Um, or you can set up really elaborate systems. Um, this is our current system. Coming off of our roof, we have nine 55 gallon drums, and then we have an additional seven that we pour that water off into so that way we have a continuous supply of rainwater for the greenhouse, for my indoor plants, all the things. It's great. And then um, that funny tube thing is the overflow so if it ever fills up that way it goes and then it drains underground in that drain thing all right seeds um this is a bunch of seeds getting soaked before i plant them so there's peas in there there's beans in there like big seeds that have a hard coat sometimes if you soak them for a few little bit before you um plant them it really helps them germinate faster don't Put your seeds in your little thing and then take the seed packet away because you will forget which seed it was is in the little thing. <laughs> I have done that. <laughs> so and so room temp or slightly warm water if it's a cold day are all good to do. Excuse me, hmm? when we forget what seed is, we just take a bag of seeds and just have a good one. You'd be really good. I have one, two, three, four, five, six. I have probably 12 different kinds of seeds there, and some of them are all the same kind, like beans, and some of them look very similar. And so I would forget which which bean is this seed. So that's why I would I want to keep track. Mm-hmm. Maybe you're smart, so you might not forget. All right. So some seeds won't germinate with light, but once seeds have germinated, light is very, 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 very important. Um. If you don't have light, they get really leggy, they, they don't grow well. So I have, um, here's the picture, but this is my little guy that I started for the class. And I started a bunch of little seeds, I'm so excited. So I have arugula and basil and um, amaranth and onions and stuff like that. And so they're all little seeds and I started in this tray because this is basil, and this is um, arugula, I think. This one's amaranth. Uh, there's some brassicas in here. I think that one's a kale. These guys are all onions. The reason why I started them in here is because I started 20 seeds or 10 seeds or things like that. And um, if I'm not sure how good my seed is or I don't want to start 20 pots, that's a lot of soil. They're going to grow big, yep. So once they get about this big, then I'm going to want to transplant them out. And so then I'll just pop them out and put them into little pots. What and type of a seed tray it's a slotted seed starting tray. So um, we've bought them from Johnny's. We've got, um, and it's a short one. And then it also, you can get a short tray on the bottom. This one, however, has holes in it, so I had to put saran wrap in the bottom so I didn't lose water through it. But um, And then that way, it's short, and it can sit on top of the heat mat because my house is not crazy warm. I would love it to be 80 degrees, but it's not. So I have a seat mat, and you put that on there, and it raises the temperature and it keeps it consistent so it's not dropping like your house gets colder at night. It doesn't drop, and then this other thing just helps keep all the heat going up and you're not losing heat. 
So I found that to be very helpful. And with the shorter seed tray, the heat actually gets to these because they're not very deep. But for me, this is amazing. I can start hundreds of seeds and not have hundreds of pots setting out. And then, um, yeah. So another thing, though, is these guys are really lanky, and they're my amaranth, and amaranth don't like it too warm. And so another reason if you don't have enough light, your legs, your things will get really leggy, but also if you have too much heat and it's actually a cooler plant, it will get leggy on you too. So that's a problem-solving thing. Basil, on the other hand, is perfectly happy. Mm-hmm. Okay, great. So I actually use my little thing, and I stick it in there, and I just pop it like that. And then I actually make a hole in the little place I'm putting it into, and I pop it right into that little hole and then press it on the edge. And then that way I'm not getting too much... A knife, a popsicle, a spoon, like whatever fits your thing. Um, when these guys are all, like I have a hundred of these in here, I just take my finger and go wonk. <laughs> and then just gently, carefully, yeah? Do you have any food here? I don't, I'm sorry. I didn't have lunch. I didn't eat lunch. Uh-oh. So any, any other questions about that? Those are good questions. Okay. If you don't have a fancy schmancy thing like this, it's okay. Get, um, okay? it's okay because there's lots of ways to grow things. So you can get a little pot like this and plant like maybe three or four seeds in it and then split it up that way kind of thing. Yes, sweetie. Um, I think we're coming to that, but I can do that. Okay, so um, I label everything, but instead of, because I start so many seeds, instead of labeling it with the thing, I have a number system that I do. And um, that way it goes, I keep track of my numbers, and then that way I can um, easily... Like, I know this is basil, because I know what basil is, but which basil is it? And if I'm starting seven kinds of basil, kind of thing. So I label everything on a number system, and I have a tag with everything. You will forget what it is if you don't label it. It just, you will. I thought I was like, oh, I'll be fine, I'll be fine. Nope, you will forget. And then I also wrote down my numbers, how many seeds I started, this is a good thing if you want to start keeping track of your germination. If you got some seed and you're like, yeah, I'm not sure how good it is. A plant of 10 seeds makes it really easy. Five of them came up. I got 50% germination. So next time I plant it, I'm like, all right, this is only 50% germination. I want 10 plants. I need to plant 20 seeds, right? So that helps that part a little bit. Or if you only want three plants and you planted 10 seeds, 100% germination, you are now having... Babies you're throwing away or babies you're giving away, you know, one of those things. Okay. Um, the reason why I use a dome, that's what this is called, is it helps keep your soil more moist. It, it keeps, it contains that moisture in there and it makes a little mini greenhouse. Um, it also helps, like, protect them kind of thing. But I find that you still want to go pet your plants because that helps strengthen their stems. Um, adversity makes us stronger. <laughs> it works for plants too. So that's another thing to do. And then my um, grow lights, you can see right through the dome. Yes. So you can kind of see there's light on this one. But this is my light rack setup. Um, they are shop lights um, with LED lights in there. You do not have to get fancy lights. You don't have to get specific grow lights, nothing. Because you're not, you're just trying to get that plant big enough in the amount of time you need to get it outside. 
You're not trying to put fruit on it. You're not trying to make it flower. You just want it to have enough light to grow. Correct. So the grow lights have the full spectrum. And the blues and the reds and in that spectrum do different things. And so we don't need that. We just need it to have enough light to grow. So having it close enough to your plants is really important. So I'm literally, mine are like right above it. Um, and that makes sure they're really lit. And then at least 12 hours of light. So you really want to have some good light. And then I think you'll be a lot more successful. Um, the price range, I just went and looked it all up, is about 40 to $80 for the entire light for LEDs. And those will last you a really long time. Or you can go to Restore and find <laughs> light for 5 bucks, and then get the whatever bulbs you want in there. It, 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 whatever works. Okay? And then you have a timer system on it, so then you don't have to remember every day to turn it on and off. You just get a little timer that plugs in. Um, I have two lights side by side that go like this over it, and then my trays go under. You can put it whatever way you want, just as long as it gets enough light. You can do that. Okay. Um, so here's another. These are some of my peppers that are underneath of a grow light. Um, so to keep things the right spacing, you can kind of see these red bumper things. They're just getting my little basils up high enough so it's close to the light, but my peppers are so tall they, you know, didn't fit. So you just move things to get, like, put things up higher, make things lower just to, to get that really close to the light, which is what you need. Okay. Then um, we invested in a little greenhouse. It was this little tent of plastic thing, you know. There's absolutely no heat in it. You put plants out in the daytime, and then you truck them all back in at night when it's cold. Um, I found that sunlight is a tremendously better than an LED light or whatever light gramp you have. Of course it is. I've made it better. <laughs> so. Um, my plants really, really did good out there, um, but it has to be warm enough. So this is about 400 to $500 for a greenhouse kit. If you have six tomatoes you're trying to grow, by all means, just get a light, put it out during daytime, bring it inside kind of thing. Um, I put all sorts of things in there. <laughs> and then this is kind of what it looked like. It has little windows that you can do the shading. That's my two figs. A couple avocados and a hibiscus plant on the outside. And then I got a greenhouse. So I designed a greenhouse. My husband and one of um, our good friends helped build it. And it's got every passive solar heating thing I could find crammed into this little 20-foot by 8-foot wide. Um, it's still, like right now... Um, but I can put things in there during the daytime. It's 75 in there right now with the sun out, which is amazing. So you just go out and sit and eat lunch. <laughs> I know, like, pretend we're into tropics um, kind of thing. And so I put plants in there. And then the plants that you see all on those patio blocks there, they're all hardening off, which is the process of taking them from a cushy life to, like, this is the real world plant. You got to deal with wind and rain and, and stuff like that. And the temperature fluctuations. So um, this sucker was 10 grand. So just, you know, a little bit of like there's a fluctuation of what you want to invest in. And then there's also like hoop houses and things like that. So this is what it looked like with a bunch of uh, plants in there. So temperature is really important. I spoke about the heat mat. Um, talked about stratification. Um, tulips. If you're ever trying to grow a tulip and it won't grow for you, if you haven't put it in 12 to 16 weeks of cold, it will not grow. So there's a heads up for all of you. Um, okay. Uh, I started seeds in my basement a lot, and it was too cold down there, and they all rotted. So that was where the heat mat really came into. Oh. My basement's in the bottom of my house. This is not my house. It's the place we go to church at. Okay. 
So hardiness zones, um, I live in 6B, depending on where you came from. You might be in 6B, 6A kind of thing. So what it does is it is a, a way of tracking how hot and cold places are in the, in the um, United States. And so we live in that really light green down the side of um, Michigan here. And that we have a maritime climate because of our water, which means that we take forever to get warm in the spring, but we stay warm in the fall. And this is really good for our plants, especially all the berry crops and the tree crops, because we don't get hit by those fault springs and it turns everything on and everything's going gangbusters and then we have a frost that kills everything. We are buffered by that because our springs are later, which is really good, but it means you don't put your tomatoes out <laughs> until it's June because we're still cold. So um, that also affects our growing days because that tells us when our first and last frosts are. And those are all things you can look up. So planting in fan, planning in fantasy land is I've got all my seed catalogs. I want all of the seeds. I'm going to grow everything. And you make lists and all that stuff. In reality, it all has to fit in your garden. <laughs> if it doesn't fit, you can't grow it, right? And so I make, um, I make little maps of what goes where in my garden with how much space I have and plan the rotations and things like that. And it seems like onerous, boring work, but it's really, really important because rotating is, is protects your soil and your plants from any pathogens. It also rotates the needs of that plant around. So some things are really, really heavy feeders and they want to suck everything out of your soil. And then some things actually return nutrient to your soil like the beans do. They put nitrogen back in your soil. So if you rotate things around, it kind of spreads out the needs of your plants. Tomatoes and the um, solanaceous plants are very, very sensitive to like viruses and things like that. So if you move them, those viruses are like, hey, there's nothing to eat. I'm going to die now. It, it helps break the cycle of disease by moving your plants around. So I suggest that you do that. This is my, <laughs> my garden book. And in it, I have every single year that we've gardened, I have all the notes from it. I have all the maps from it. So I can go back and see what I've done where. I can see what did good. I can see what did really horrible. I can say, oh, this did not work. Don't do this again. Or this worked really well. Keep this layout for a garden. Um, and it kind of helps. After a while, you just sort of like, all right, I'm going to copy this one. I'm going to redo this plan. And that, that helps you figure things out. Yep, you can see my table. Okay, um, one of the things that I have that's very helpful, Timothy wrote me, he's a computer genius, and he wrote me a garden time app. And it's actually an app that tracks all my plants, all the information about each kind of plant and it puts it all into a form that I can go and on that list it'll tell me when to plant things it'll tell me when to put it in the ground it'll tell me when my harvest starts it tells me when my harvest should be done so that way I can organize all my seed duties jobs and keep up on it I don't have to figure this out like I was doing these little envelopes and I would say six weeks out and I put everything in the envelope and I'm like okay now now this much out and this all I have to do is go look at it and see, oh, I need to plant these six things today. Oh, and that's due tomorrow. Okay, well, let's plant these seven things. And then it keeps me going. It also helps me with my rotation, and it helps me with my succession planting. Because it reminds me, oh, yeah, I need to go plant some more lettuce because I want to have lettuce continually all summer. And it's free. Um, he has one for Android, and he also has a Windows version. And um, if you want... It's on this computer, so if you are interested in looking at it or getting it, um, I will have our website up at the end, and you can go there and get it. Um, if you have questions, Timothy can let you know. All right, here's the thing with the labeling. I started out with uh, popsicle sticks <laughs> and writing it on there. It worked, but the popsicle sticks uh, broke down after um, a little bit. So I have done things like... 
Um, these plant labels is what I do the numbers on. I went to the number system. For my tomatoes, I have a clothespin that I painted and I stick it to the tomato cage. <laughs> and then I can see what the tomato is when I'm out in the garden picking it. Otherwise, you're like, there's six tomatoes. They all look the same. Which one is it? And this way it kind of helps label my tomatoes. Um, I have used little sticks that you get with the meat. Like, well done, rare meat. I've written on that. Um, there's fancy schmancy ones <laughs> I've yet to use. Um, I'm probably going to, like, punch love and hope and joy or something and don't stick it in the garden. Because um, I start too many things. I have four kinds of spinach. I don't want to just write spinach. I want to know what kind of spinach it is. So you want to see that? So there's different ways. If you just want to say spinach, you can say spinach. But label your stuff. Otherwise, you're going to forget what it is. You're going to forget what you need to do to harvest it. You know, if um, I have head lettuce and leaf lettuce. Okay, you guys go back in color, right? If I have head lettuce and leaf lettuce sitting next to each other in a bed, one of them I want to be picking every couple of days, right? The other one I need to make a head. I need to leave it alone. I can't pick it. And so if I know the difference, I will let my head lettuce grow. If I don't, I will be picking my head lettuce and then not get, you know, my romaine nice plant later. So that's a good reason to, to label things. Um, harden off is just making your plant realize there's a great big world out there and life is no longer cushy. So <laughs> just gets it used to the wind and the sun and, and all of that. Planting out, I get my tray. This is all lettuce in there, so I just get it out and space it all out so it looks all cute and in a line, all organizing. Okay. Potting up. So this is a little cabbage in one of these little pots, okay? And that's what the root system looks on it. That is a beautiful root system. It's nice and white. It's just reaching the outside of the pot. It's not root bound. So I potted it up into, I don't actually have one of those here, but it's probably a little bit bigger, the equivalent of one of these. And it already looks like a bigger plant in that little pot, doesn't it? And then it grew to this size in that pot. And so when I planted it out, I had twice as big of a plant going into the ground that much further ahead. And that's a great, it's not root bound. All those roots are nice and white, which is what you want to see. And then that goes in the ground. And another thing is you can take that and set it in a little deeper so it's not got that wobbly stem. So if it's, you know, kind of a little long, set it a little deep, and then you've got a, a sturdier plant. These are the same tomatoes, same everything, except one I planted up and the other one I didn't need. So I just sort of left it in this little pot because I couldn't bear to throw it away. But, yeah, and that's the difference between the two potting it up, what that does to it. And you have to thin. <laughs> so there's two seeds in this one little pot, and one of them was doing awesome, and I, you only want one. And so instead of pulling it out, just cut it, because then you're not damaging the roots. Okay, you can grow lettuce in a hanging basket. Stick it next to your thing. Isn't it pretty? Like, lettuce is gorgeous. So... Okay, so encouragement for when you fail. <clears throat> this is my first attempt at growing tomatoes. <laughs> Isn't that pitiful? <laughs> That's awful. I did everything wrong. Okay, this is me a few years later. And this is my tomatoes last year in my greenhouse. And those were in these size buckets. They had been planted up twice. And I was able to give tomatoes to a few people and it was it was just really cool to hand somebody something that is full of my love and my energy and my time and like you're important you get one of my tomatoes so okay when things go wrong so damping off is a very common thing your little plant stem just like withers away to nothing the whole thing falls over and you're like no so it, that's caused by a pathogen in the soil. It means your soil's not sterile, whatever. Um, as you can see, there's only one 
the rest of them were fine. Um, but cool, wet conditions is where it tends to come out a lot more. So if you keep your soil warm, it usually helps prevent that. This is not enough light, so everything's getting leggy, and it's definitely aiming towards my slider window. It didn't have lights on top of it. Well, let's see, there's a few more things. So light is one of them, and too hot is another reason that it gets leggy. And then inconsistent watering actually will cause your plant to stress out, and it'll try to reach for light. So on my seed tray, I usually spray, use a little spray once the soil's wet and I plant my seed, I use a spray bottle to keep it wet. Um, once I get them into pots, I will often put them into a seed tray or a tray like this, and you stack all your pots in there. You can fill this with water, and all your plants will soak it up through the bottom. So that's a way to bottom water something um, because all those beautiful holes you have in the bottom of your pots make sure that they can get stuff up. So this is usually a second second stage that I pot them up. I like to put my peppers in there because they're so slow growing, but they want the space. And then this one, I usually do like my onions because onions don't need a ton of space. And I do several hundred onions. This helps <laughs> you to not have as much space out there. Mmm. Yeah, I, well, I'm, you'll, maybe you'll learn to grow them. Like them. All right. Um, there's, <laughs> these are really, really looking for sun. Um, another thing you can do is once they get to this point and you have everything fixed, you can put a fan on it, and it helps create that adversity. It makes a stronger stem. Or you can pet them. Like I pet to them. I pet my plants. I blow on them. I talk to them. <laughs> grow, guys, grow. Um, all right. This, again, is identical plants. Everything is the same except pot size. And by the end of summer, you can tell the difference between the size of the pot for the plant. One got more nutrient. There was more in the soil, more water, the consistent, more water. And one, they're very different. Those are both um, Greek basil, which are really cute plants. Okay, pests. That is a cutworm. He is evil. I do not know why God made cutworms. They come around. They're like, oh, it's a plant. <laughs> okay, I'm bored. And they go away. They don't even eat the plant. Like, if you ate it, it makes... Anyway, they're this ugly brown little worm, and they live usually... If a plant gets cut down and it's laying down like it just got timbered, usually he's within six inches of the soil around that little plant and you want to get them because he's going to go to the next one down the line and they will literally go cut down a plant cut down a plant and you will just see this line of plants cut down by these things there's a worm on there that little round thing is a worm kind of like a brown grub. Mm -hmm. yes so anyway i have a Yep, I'll pick them up in a minute. Yes, that could be that could be helpful. This is another thing we did. This is a um a yogurt cup. Cut out the bottom, and then you put this around and set it in. Make sure there's no cutworm inside your little circle, <laughs> and this will protect your um, plant from cutworms. And then um. Like if you got a vole in your garden, it can protect it from that a little bit. Um, and it also protects your plant, especially if it's really small. It just sort of kind of makes a little thing. But this really helped us. We were losing, oh man, one year we had a ton of cutworms. And I think we were losing pepper plants like crazy. And pepper plants are so hard to grow already. Um, so we went out and put these around every single pepper plant. And then it we stopped it. They're about that long, but they you will find them usually curled up like this. They're usually in a little circle. Do it. Do it. <laughs> <laughs> like, if I could rent a chicken or three or four chickens to go through my garden before I plant, they would find all the cutworms and eat them. <laughs> like, yes. 
<laughs> Just, I'm rented chicken. <laughs> I'm glad for you. So this is a mole. Um, he he. They're kind. They're the softest things ever. Like they are so soft, but they are very destructive because they just go through things. That one's dead. <laughs> he got murdered <laughs> with the implement you see him on. <laughs> he did it. He, he, I think. He, we, we, he had to die because when he was found, he was in the middle of my garden making tunnels through my tomatoes. And that was not an acceptable place for him to be. <laughs> Just be prepared for holes then. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. So he he was able to get it. Um, we've tried traps. We've tried a lot of things, and those didn't seem to work very well. But yeah. Yep. So. Maybe so. And this one is a vole. Voles are worse than mice. They have a little short tail, so that's how you usually identify them. They chew the bark off of trees. They they just are, um, they will eat your plants. They will straight up eat your plants. And so that's not cool. We have yet to get one of those. They're fast. Oh, that's true. So Timothy made an upside down bucket and we found their holes in the ground and he put a mouse trap with peanut butter on it next to the hole, like right where the hole entrance is, and then put the bucket over the whole thing. So they're coming out into the dark and they don't see the mouse trap. And then the next day we find things. And it's good. <laughs> I'm so bloodthirsty, aren't I? <laughs> so we have we have gotten those in the mouse traps. Thank you. So seeds, um, Herrick District Library actually has a seed library, so there's things that you can go there. I also have seeds back in the back um, that you may take. Um, the drawings that we have up here, um, there are seed labels and all the instructions for some of them back there. And then um, if you want to take an entire packet and there's just a few seeds, you're welcome to. If more than one person wants the same kind of seeds, there is some paper back there that you can write the seed information on and then one person you know like share it that way a little bit um but those are definitely for you guys to take and, and use um these are some of my seed catalogs the thing that i think is most important about your seed is that you are growing it organically because a seed is in the ground so long a plant is in the ground so long to create a seed the cultivation of that plant is different than what you would do for getting food from it and so sometimes you're like well people aren't eating this so it doesn't matter as much what I'm using on it because it's not actually going into someone's mouth but that seed that plant what it's gone through has been put into that seed and the seed is going to expect the same treatment when it gets into your garden so if you have a seed that's used to having everything around it suppressed, doesn't have to do anything, it's not going to be as hardy as a seed that grew up organically, it grew up in a more natural way, then you are putting that into your garden and it's going to be growing that way. There's also things that are positive with, if you get a seed that was grown and bred in the north in our area, it is acclimated to our area. So if I grow something that grew in Texas, it wants Texas heat. It wants Texas life. Michigan's not Texas. That seed's going to not be as happy as a seed that grew in Michigan or Vermont or Maine or in the northern area. And so that also makes a difference too. So my seed that I, the kale back there is a red Russian kale and I think I'm on my fifth generation of it. It overwinters in my yard because it's a biennial. And so next spring, I'm picking kale before my baby kale that I'm restarting for the new year is growing. So I'm getting kale 
in March. I didn't do anything. I just left the plant. So high mowing is a good place. Uh, yes. So all of these are northern seas. High mowing is actually in Vermont, and they are uh, um, employee owned. Um, Johnny's has excellent seed catalogs. Even if you never order from them, their seed cart catalog is amazing because it has all the information in it. They're also an employee owned company. They also sell a lot of organic seed. Um, Botanical Interests up there has the most incredible seed packets that I don't know if I have any here. They have artists on staff that um, draw all their stuff. It's beautiful. Rare Seeds has not very good information on their packets, but they have a lot of um, small farmers that source into them, and they also have a lot of rare things. So interesting cucumbers that grew in Thailand or J Japan, and Japan is actually on the same line as us, which sounds strange, but they're the same as we are. Um, and then Southern Exposure Seed Exchange and Seeds of Change. Both of those are American companies that preserve seeds, really try to keep the heirloom seeds going. Um, so these are ones that I have found to be very helpful for me. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, here is our website. And um, there's my uh, blog that I don't do a whole lot on, but every once in a while I post some interesting things or pictures or um, teaching stuff on there. Um, so I just want to, I want to pray a blessing over all of your seeds and land and sowing and growing. I think it's, um, it's going to be more important than, for a lot of us it's a hobby. Like, oh, I'm going to grow seed. I can always go to the grocery store and get food. But I'm going to grow this plant because it's fun. And there may be a time when we don't have the ability to go to the grocery store and get food. And growing that seed is going to turn from a hobby into a necessity. And I think while we are in the shallow end of the pool now, <laughs> we can learn how to swim so that when we are in the deep end, we can help ourselves and we can help others around us. And we can say, hey, We've got this. Let's do this. And so that's why I find so much hope in a seed because there is so much potential, so much life. And one seed can give you hundreds, sometimes thousands more seeds. And that gives you food and it gives you, um, there's a stability in growing something. You, you have a purpose. You have a place. And so I just want to pray a blessing over that. And then... Um, We'll do any questions if there's anything I haven't covered. Um, and then um, all the seeds, if you're interested in seeds, if you want have questions about that, we'll do that. And then we'll pack up and go home. So, dear Heavenly Father, I just thank you for all the blessings and the gifts that you've given us. I thank you for the possibility and the gift of seeds. And I pray over each person and family here that you will bless the hands that work the soil, that you will bless the seeds that they are given and they grow and they source, that you will help them to find joy in growing something and that they will have good harvests and a just fun doing it and, and find that incredible joy that I have in growing a plant and that all of the frustration and things that go wrong, that they will be learning events, not just confounding puzzles. And I thank you for all these people. I thank you for your goodness and your kindness. In Yeshua's name, amen. Right, is there any questions that anybody has? All right. Oh, wait, I should probably leave that up. Yes. So your sun is probably the most important thing because your soil you can amend. So you want to have at least eight to an amazing spot would have like 10 hours of sun. Eight hours of sun is great. Six hours, anything below six hours, you're then working into only vegetable crops, things that grow leaves, not a fruit. So like tomatoes, cucumbers, all of those are fruits 
corn's a fruit, um, <laughs> but lettuce, uh, broccoli, kale, uh, radishes, carrots, all of those things are your vegetables. They don't need as much sun to grow. So that would be, find that. So like where your tree lines are, um, go out and look at your garden. One easy way is to go look at your garden at 8 o'clock in the morning, take a picture of it or where you're thinking. Come back in an hour, take another picture of it. Take them back in an hour, take another picture of it. And just, you don't even have to think about it. Just come stand in the same spot, take a picture of it. And then by the end of the day, if you go from 8 to 8, you can see where the sun was and all right so we have spring is the middle of the equinox is coming up i think next week um so that's where your sun is at the switch part so we i have one part like in my backyard the sun is mostly there and then for a very short amount of time i actually have sun on the front of my house in the north because our sun goes so far over and then it goes all the way back so your shadows do change so especially if you have a a line of something on your south side that can affect where your your line is if you have fences that affects it too so it's not impossible you just taking that picture really really helps cuz then you just sort of don't have to think about it you just go flip 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 oh <laughs> or yay you know whatever okay good question <laughs> Uh-huh. So every seed wants to grow, right? And so I take my avocado seed, I put it in a pot with damp soil, take a baggie, stick it over the top, and forget about it for two months. And then it starts growing. Anytime you want a tree. It does need to be warm, though. And so for me, I stick it on a part where it's it, it gets consistent heat. Um, in the summertime, is usually easiest kind of thing. But um, I don't stick the toothpicks and stick it in water. I don't do any of that. I usually don't even do my cuttings that way. I just stick them in moist soil, and they grow. Um. <clears throat> the avocados I just killed in my greenhouse were four feet tall. So <laughs> at some point, Timothy's not sad. <laughs> He's like, <laughs> we probably won't. You For most trees, you don't get fruit for three to seven years after growing it from a seed, right? And then if it's a male and female plant, like my date palm, there's male and female ones. He's going to be a bachelor for life or, uh, you know, uh, I don't know what what it, uh, what it gender it is, but um, he's probably, I'm never going to get a date. <laughs> but he's just cool. I got a date palm. He's a bachelor. <laughs> and, yeah, and you do often, like mulberries is a really good example of a plant that has male and female plants. And so you don't know until it starts creating blossoms and that won't happen for maybe the first five years or so of the plant and then when you look at the blossom you can tell is this a male or a female tree and that one um yeah so we have about 15 mulberry trees in our yard and we went through and cut out all but like three of the guys sorry guys <laughs> and we have a white of dark purple and a pink mulberry in our tr in our yard and then we have like four three four guys around um like holly holly's got male and female plants and so if your holly never gets flower never gets berries it's because it's a boy but you're probably pollinating every other person's holly in your entire neighborhood so um but like tropical plants probably the biggest thing is you got to keep it warm consistently warm it can't handle you just have to keep it warm all winter and in enough light if it's below 40 it will die my greenhouse got down to 19 it died um we don't i'm sorry so um that's that's one thing you could do i've started all kinds of plants and then they eventually get um, next because my husband would like to have windows I don't know why <laughs> but
But um, so we can only fit so many things in our house. But I have a greenhouse now. So, yeah, I, I find lots of things are fun to grow. And even if you only keep it for a season, it's still fun just to grow something, right? It's There's no harm in that. Um, this is one thing I didn't show. This is how I keep my seeds. Um, I have them alphabetized in here. And then this is opaque. So it, they don't get a lot of sun. And then it stays in my basement, so it stays consistently cool. And then all my seeds go in here. And then, um, yeah. Used to be a lot fatter, but then I went and purged seeds, and then I brought a bunch to share. So, yeah. Any other questions? You guys are... Sure, that's a whole other class. But yes, it's so much fun. So if you are going to harvest seeds, make a plan before you want to go into it. Because um, harvesting seeds means you have to let something go ripe and then past ripe in order to get the seeds. Some things you can harvest seeds right out of, like a pepper. You can harvest the seed from a ripe pepper and it's, it's done enough. But like a cucumber, once it's made seeds... The plant goes, sweet, I have done my job, I'm kaput. And that p cucumber will no longer give you any more cucumbers because it's got too old of cucumbers. And so if you want to harvest cucumber seeds, you have to sort of figure out, okay, I'm going to get this much harvest out of it, and then I'm going to let these three cucumbers, like mark them somehow, go and go past, and then that way you can harvest that cucumber seed. Um, if you want to grow a pumpkin... Make sure there's no other pumpkins or other things that will cross with that pumpkin in order to get viable seed out of that. It depends on the plant. So um, there's a book. I can see the cover. Seed saving. I think it's just seed saving. It's got um, that grid that was. Yes. It has all the distance. Yeah. But if you go to the specific thing for the specific plant, you will have all the information. And it makes it really good because you don't have to remember, which obviously I'm not. I just go look at my book. <laughs> or look it up online, too. Um, if you go to one of the seed companies and look up on their line, don't just go to some random place because there's a lot of misinformation on the Internet now. It makes me kind of mad. I want to jump up and down and go, that's not true. And all these poor people are going to try it and then be like, I suck. Like, no. You can't do that. It doesn't work that way um, kind of thing. So seed saving, have a plan of what you want to do. And then some things are very easy. And some things you... Um, beans are really easy. Um, tomatoes are usually very easy once you process them correctly. But you don't have to worry about crossing so much, um, that kind of thing. Um, so a couple first easy ones to do. Anything that's a biennial, you have to let it grow all the way through winter and go over the next year. That's your brassicas and stuff like that. But those are really easy. I've never gotten a carrot to grow successfully, so I've never. <laughs> I cannot make them grow in my sand. They dry out. So we're going to grow them inside, and I'm going to transplant them out. That's my goal this year. I'm going to eat a carrot. No. So the reason why you can't transplant stuff is if you mess with the root. So if you can successfully not hurt the root, you can transplant anything. It's just don't mess with the root too much. <laughs> so I've got a plan. We're going to do this. I'm going to eat a carrot. <laughs> I'm going to eat a carrot. <laughs>